Scooter was so connected that when he brought on Justin Bieber, he's like, yeah, you're good, but I'm going to introduce you to Usher. And Usher's going to introduce you Usher. to Usher. Uh, <laughs> and Usher introduced him to a swag coach, a coach that a would teach coach? Justin oh, Bieber to how have a little more of swag Who and how to be cool. Usher? So the, uh, next tra- so the next time I'm on the podcast and you introduce me, I think you can, you can I say can I'm, I'm a swag, swag coach. coach. Swag. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Chasing Mountains podcast. Today, we have our friend Phil again. Phil, honestly, look, Phil is an engineer, a brilliant guy, but he's also a very talented musician. And, you know, this is a story about Scooter Braun. He's the man who basically is the manager for so many people. And so it's a we have to cram a lot in a short amount of time. So yep. he focused on a certain part of his life. Dave focused on a certain part of his life. I kind of focused on some of the early history. And so hopefully together we kind of can learn something. So it's going to be fun. Also... Thank you this guys episode, for me. This episode brought to you by Chipotle. Yeah. Yes. We decided we like doing that. So here we well, are. Well, a lot of it is, is we're running out of time and we mm, want to yeah. eat some lunch. Uh, so Scooter Braun, for those who don't know, is a manager for, uh, well, first off, I didn't realize his name was Scott. It's not Scott. It's, you thought his parents just named him Scooter? You don't know. I, mean, <laughs> I, I was thankful to find out that his name was normal. Normal? Okay. And I mean, my parents Scooter. named my sister Ilea, yeah. spelled with an A. So Scooter is not... <laughs> It, uh, like, it, it actually helped, honestly, just that part helped me change my, my opinion about it <laughs> in, in, a, in a more positive direction, honestly. So, Phil, you looked into a little bit yeah. of, like, first off, who he, I could talk a little bit of the early days, but, like, mm-hmm. who is this guy and yeah. why should people mm-hmm. kind of care of who he is? Can I, can I yeah. real quick, let, let me push pause on that question. Okay. We'll come back to it. Who is this guy? Yeah. Why should people care who he is? Can we just real quick go around the table? We all do yeah, yeah. or have worked in the music or entertainment business. Yeah. So, um, let's talk about that really quick. Yeah. Um, you go last cause yours is the most, <clears throat> you know, the, the widest, the, the depth and breadth of, uh, experience, but, um, you I, go first. Yeah. I currently work in marketing, but, uh, my wife, we mentioned Ilea performing artists, um, play guitar for her, um, written a few songs, but worked with you, um, for your company, uh, when we were doing video production for Warner music, Nashville, Sony 300 entertainment, uh, did a bunch of video projects for those folks, um, and just kind of marketing content as well. Um, and so having an LLC that was, you know, sharing that with Ilea, that was originally, uh, for the music business and, and for her, everything that she was doing, um, it's kind of an eye opener. And I I've done deep dives into what we're going to talk about today, which is, you know, royalties, sync licensing, um, publishing, songwriting, uh, a really, really interesting world that people hear about, but I don't think know it's a lot about. confusing world. Yeah. Number so, one. Super complex. Lots of so, people involved. Go. You're up. Yeah. So my primary... This is Phil, if you're listening. By Thank the way. you. And he's Thank not you. a scratch and sniff enthusiast. <laughs> if anybody really cares. Yeah. Um, mechanical engineer during the day. And then in my free time, I spend a lot of time playing music at church, obviously. Um, that's worship pretty, leader. Yeah. Worship leader at our church. Big church. Big music. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, and then more recently, though, I've gotten the opportunity actually to play with you and Ilea. Um, when Which was very seamless. Like oh, yeah. when yeah, you came awesome. on board, it was like he already knew how to perform. He already knew how to hit the cues. Oh, someone's messing up. Just go with it. Like he's, yeah. <clears throat> he's been like there. That's like most of the show. <laughs> yeah. Someone's messing up. Yeah. Like, Dave that's messing a skill up. that comes from years and years yeah. of grinding it out. And you've been doing it at the church for a many. long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Eight years at this point um, at the church we're currently at, but I've been doing it since I was in eighth grade and we'll let you figure out how long that is. But uh, I think almost, actually almost 20 years I've been playing guitar and try and, and learn to lead worship. But what, what was really interesting is that uh, doing, doing music inside the church, a lot of it's volunteer. A lot of it is it's, it's for a specific purpose. And then when I got to more involved with you and Ilea, and even in some of like the video shoots that you've done, Jake, well, I guess we were all involved in them. Yeah, but, Phil's been in like some fairly big time yeah, artists' I videos. Try, trying to be, but <laughs> yeah, but the it was really interesting to get exposure to the other sides of the business and and even, not even necessarily being in meetings, but like hearing about, oh, I had got this email from this promoter and it was frustrating because he said this, 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 and this, and we don't have this much time and, and, and worrying about like, if you're the opening act, you get this much freedom to do what you want. If you're the feature, you get this much. And then, you know, so it's, it was, I, I did not realize how complicated it really can be. 
And so, so it was, but it was also really fun too to, to kind of learn that side of it from uh, just being with you guys. It's a lot of fun. It is. For me, I owned a creative firm where we did music videos for Warner Music, um, Sony Records, and Big Machine Record Labels, which I know mm-hmm. we'll talk yep. about them. Did we ever, did they actually, did we actually land a deal with them or was that just, I can't remember. Either way, we've worked. We had flex. a meeting with their creative director. I can't remember. Um, I can't remember if we actually did a project with them or not. Good flex. That was good flex. I, did, did I we? think we did. We, yeah. I think we, we, did. we did nail a deal with Big Machine I can't, and, and Sony. How many deals, how are many you, deals <laughs> did we have? Did I we love, get three deals? Oh, the thing is, is we did so many projects. I don't remember. Also, for a while there, I owned a record label where I was and on the label. Company. And a publishing yep. company. Uh, so I've done record label stuff, publishing, mm-hmm. tour management, management of artists. I've also music did the production. music production. Yeah, I forgot. Yeah. Um, you, can, I'm also, you can mix, you can shoot, you can pull focus. Yeah. You can um, be the boss. You can also be the grunt too. I also take out it. the trash all the time. Yeah. You're a mm-hmm. billboard charting artist. I am, yes. Yeah. You, I think. And on The View. Yeah. Performed on The View, broke some, I think, yeah. iTunes records we back did. when it was iTunes. Yeah. Um, not like and Blake Shelton and Vinyl Records. You. Yeah, they yeah, back on awesome. which we should talk about that sometime, not today, but about and you did not experience. get super wealthy off of Blake Shelton impersonating you. God, no. how much we did you make from that? Zero. <laughs> they paid us zero. They ripped off our song, played a version of it, but because it was a comedic uh, interpretation of the song, I didn't get a dime. Anyways, it was on SNL. So, uh, anyways, that's a quick summation of kind of what what we yeah. do. So your question of Scooter Braun and um, why and the reason we we're talking about him is because he's more impactful to pop culture than people really believe, and he's young. He started really young. I mean, kind of started this forty one. He's I think he's forty one right now, right? And he started mm-hmm. twenty mm-hmm. in the industry. So Scooter has been a massive part. I mean, there's a link I put over there of like just some of his artists. Mm-hmm. Um, just click on that. I believe um, it's crazy. Yeah, can you kind of just go through yeah. some of them, Irene? So make that full screen if you can. Right there off the top, Ariana Grande, right? Huge pop star. And then the next, right next to her, Ashley Graham is a model, right? So it's oh, not- Oh, she does modeling. She, yeah, she, she's a supermodel. And so it's not just a music uh, artist right there. You got Black Eyed Peas there. Is that Dan and Shay? Yes, Dan and Shay. So country, not just pop, right? Carly Rae Jepsen, Demi Lovato's there. Um, Shakira? Oh, here's another one. So Shakira, right below Demi Shakira. Lovato is Adina Menzel. So that's Frozen, guys. Nah. Okay. Really? Frozen. Adina Menzel was Elsa in Frozen. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. She can sing. Right. Justin Bieber. Huge. Shoot. Lil Dicky. Huge. Huge. Psy is huge. And then yeah. keep going. Uh, Quavo. Quavo. He huge. is Quavo. Tori, um, Tori Kelly. Really? Go back up with that kid. Is that um, the, the blonde kid? What's his name? Um, uh, Kid Leroy. Kid Leroy. I mean, he blew up like a year and a half, two years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's so diverse. So basically, home runs all around, like everywhere. And just absolutely, and, and this doesn't really, I think, account for past artists, obviously, too, right? Like no, because he had Kanye. Yeah, he had deals with Kanye before. Yep. Yeah, I think this is important, and we're going to pull this up, Irene. There is a picture uh, of, um, I think it's in my messages of kind of the breakdown of the music industry. And I think people can get confused as we talk a little bit. Yep. There are many pieces of the pie. When it comes towards music, um, Jake, okay. I have, so I have a question yeah. for you. As you talk <clears throat> through this, can can you maybe help us understand how many of these pieces of the pie are needed, and how many of them oh. are sort of <laughs> in, any more? Uh, well, well, in, in, inserted yeah. for the benefit of. <sighs> yeah, I could really rant and rave about that for hours because yeah. Okay, so for those who don't really know, it's not just Dave releasing a song and then all of a sudden. It's number one on the charts. He's got a tour going on where only, it's just- Only Jake does that. Yeah. Really yeah. songs and they skyrocket to number one. <laughs> the tour bus Thank just you. shows up with all the gear <laughs> right. and, the, and the musician, the supporting band, and the hotels are booked. There's the dozens, if not hundreds of people behind you to make that happen. Because a lot of times the thing that makes you a wonderful musician means you're probably also terrible at bookkeeping, scheduling- Waking up at the right time. Um, but yeah, Irene, if you look at this, you got the artist. And then it goes to the manager. That's the person who just directly oversees the artist. And then they kind of book the deal with the record label. They find you the label. And a lot of times people don't understand is you can have different labels for different albums. Yep. And all a label is, is literally a label. 
Warner Brothers. It was just slapped on the side of a record. Oh, it's from Warner Brothers, so it must be good. So it became the label. And they handle like the music videos. They try to make book deals with distribution. But then there's the publisher that has nothing to do with the label. They own the actual intellectual rights to the song. They help get it on the radio. They, they, contr- they actually get the money from mm-hmm. the radio stations, from TV shows. They try to book it in with movies. So, and then, um, so they get like movie TV shows over there on the far right hand side, game commercials. And then there's radio music underneath the, the publishing. Underneath the publishing is then distribution. And then, so if you look at the label, the label works with promotion, but then also there's the booking agency, a completely different agency that deals with booking the shows. And the interesting thing is under that booking agency, then there is a tour manager, someone who has nothing to do with the The, manager. The the manager manager. So a lot of times the manager manager will be at conflicts with the tour manager or the agency manager. So the manager, Scooter Braun today, is kind of the person who is playing defense against all these other people for the artist. Artists don't want to do this stuff a lot of times alone at a certain scale. However, I agree to what you were kind of hinting to earlier is you can do a lot of this now by yourself. You don't need the industry near as much, Mm -hmm. but when you're Justin Bieber level, it's, it starts to get pretty tough. Irene, thank you for, for pulling that up. Um, So his mom and dad, they were both orthodontist or, or dentist or whatever it was. So very, kind of like upper middle class and uh, they kind of were really for him to go to school, just kind of the traditional way. Um, But something right off the bat that he always said that kind of was interesting to me, every single night his father would come in and he would tell them boys, because there's two guys to one room, two boys. He goes, I need you to know that you're special, but that comes with certain responsibilities. That's good. You, it's not just one of the things where you guys are special, whatever you're going to do, it's going to be great. And it was like, (laughs) but with that specialty, you've got to achieve, you got to strive. And when everybody else can't, you can, but you have to understand what that comes responsibility of work and understanding and being smarter and working harder than everyone else and smarter. And so at a young age, you know, they heard that for 15 years of their life, it kind of gets ingrained. And he said, I never thought I couldn't like when someone said, Oh, you know, I'm going to be the best champion for basketball. He was just like, Oh yeah, we are. And he's like, well, I didn't think I'm short. I'm, I'm this, I'm yeah. that. It was like, oh, I'm going to. So then he would just figure out how to do it. It wasn't the list of things why he can't. He more looked at that as the list of why he needs to focus on other things. So yeah. I like that early on his parents instilled kind of a, not just your special, but like you got to think about it. You got to work on it. The right kind of confidence. Yeah. And when he went off to college, I think like a lot of kids, they, they partied. And um, early on, he kind of got into the gig of doing fake IDs. And he, he yeah. met up with this guy making a fake ID. And he was like, oh, you're, you know, you're good at making IDs, but you're kind of bad at like managing this. He goes, I don't want to know your name. I'll give you a fake name. You, you give me a fake name. We'll just meet up on this terms. And as soon as that like stops, we're ending this. When we get friendly, this is it. Where it's over. So they were selling a bunch of fake IDs and making a lot of money. And eventually that guy got too chummy and kind of apparently found out his real name. So he called it off. And I guess like a week or two later, the guy ended up in jail. So he cut it off Jeez. at the right time. But with doing that, he kind of got into the party scene. I was like, wait, what's going on with this like promotion stuff? And yeah. he, he was like, he talked to a club person. He's like, I think I could put on like an event. And they're like, well, what's like a lot of people? They're like 800 people. He's like, fine, we'll do that. We'll have 800 people show up at this party. He had never thrown a party like this before. But he got together with his friends. Of course, he knew first thing he got he got to get good looking girls like yeah. to these parties. So yeah. he started inviting all the girls. Had the girls passing out all the flyers. Had the girls there inviting all the boys. There you go. So it shows he knows how to think. And then he turned around and he became very successful in the Atlanta scene. So that's where he was at school. I forget the name of the school. I don't know if it really matters, but um, he became really successful, making a lot of money with club promotion. Just in college. Doing, in college. Just messing around, basically. Messing around. Um, and it, it got so Messing good. around, but intentionally. Yes. Messing around, clearly. But it got so good, and he was making so much money, he stopped going to college. But he was so afraid to tell his mom and dad. And <laughs> at one point in time, he was telling his parents, like, look, I'm so good at what I'm doing. I'm going to take over paying the bills for college. 
And then they just kept getting like the transcripts of how the kids are doing, you know, how his kids are doing in school, blah, blah, blah. He stopped going to school, but he was so afraid of his parents not knowing or knowing that he was gone. He continued to pay for school. Jeez. <laughs> and he's not working until they, the, they, they called him. It was like, your kid hasn't shown up for like six months. And his grades are obviously, <laughs> but he's, Zero. but someone's still paying the bills. But someone's yeah. still paying the bills. He was so afraid of his parents being disappointed in him. That's that he, insane. Yeah. And then, so what he did was like, look, the, the counselor came to him and was like, what's going on? You on drugs? You, are you, you, drugs? you, you depressed? What's going on? Your grades have dropped. You're just, you're not even there. And he, ex no, I'm, I'm good. I'm just doing this promotion thing and I'm doing so well. Uh, he's like, you know what? I, I don't need I don't think I need school. And the guy was like, no, he go, and he pointed at a guy on the wall and he said, you see that guy? He's the biggest donator to this entire college. He's gone on to make billions of dollars. He's done all this great thing. He goes, but you need to understand that's one in a billion. You got to get back to school. And the guy was like, wait, you're poo pooing on my dream of success. He was like, no, nah, I'm done. So he dropped out of school and he hits uh, being a promoter full time. The cool thing is in this process, he actually met a guy from so, so deaf. Y'all remember uh, that record label? That, I yeah. think, I, yeah, I've heard yeah. of that, yeah. Um, so, so deaf, and he met the guy, I think it's uh, Jermaine Dupree. Do you guys know who that yeah. is? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. And so in the club scene, he met, it's in Atlanta. That's where hip hop is. Yeah. He meets all the guys in the parties and in the clubs. All the, the famous actors, all the famous like LL Cool J, Usher, all these people. And he meets Jermaine, and Jermaine's like, you're my guy. They quit this shit. Come work for my company. And he, he was like, he's 20. And he's looking up to this guy and he was just like, this is how hip hop works in Atlanta. Come, come work with me. So he put him as like an A&R rep or like a VP quick in this company, even though it was a smaller, as they call boutique company where they were hitting hits yeah, after hits. Yeah. So at 20, he's like thrust into the industry and he's... Jim, uh, Jermaine was smart enough to see that like this kid kind of like was young enough in to have like, you know how kids like they have that innate ability to see what's coming mm -hmm. because they're just so enthralled in like the new fads and all that stuff. They're just paying attention. Paying attention. Well, he was that kid for Jermaine. So he goes to actually work with So So Deaf for I think it was like five years or so. And he worked his way up, did a bunch of successful things. But um, with getting into that, he... He kind of learned like the rope and didn't, he was just like, my goodness, this is so complex, but here's how we can do it. And he kept telling him, look, this social media thing is a big freaking deal. Um, we should do something with it. We should work with the A&R reps and let's, let's make something happen. And they overlooked it like Facebook and this, this YouTube thing, yeah. it's never going to work. It's not going to last. And, you know, so they ignored him and he got really frustrated. And apparently uh, Jermaine's mom was a big part of the record label and she didn't like Scooter. And at one point in time, she blew up at him at a big meeting and he talked back to her. It was basically like, Hey, you know, we're not here trying to take advantage of your son. Like you think you, we are, we all had businesses before we all came here to work with him. And he's like, he thought he had like yeah. basically calmed her down and they even hung out that night. But he said, by the time he showed up next morning for work, he had a letter in his mailbox that basically said he had to get out. And so he left. And he left and he realized I could start my own company. And he started a company called, I think it's called SB Projects. Yeah. Scooter Brown SB Projects. Projects. Yep. And when, had, so when was, that would have been, I think that was 2007. Which yeah. intervened In when you know, because like, yeah, 2007 I only was when he established SB Projects. So that was, would have been around the time that he left Jermaine Dupree. Okay. Right. Exactly. <clears throat> 2007. Yep. So, and then I'll be done here. After, this is my last portion right here. He left and he said he had 13 months of runway to start a company, find a couple acts. And after that 13 months, he would be completely out of money. And it's still a lot of money. It's a lot. Think about it, but, but I mean, yeah. he worked at a, it was a pretty high up yeah. at a company and he saved his money and 13 months. And so what he did was he was looking for acts. So he, he started a company without any acts. Yeah. But what a way to start off your company is, First off, you know all the people in the hip hop industry. Yeah. You, um, and this is when hip hop was really coming onto the main stage. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of his background to getting started to his company. And that's kind of where I went. And I know he was a huge Michael Jackson fan. And he thought, if I can find someone young and still believes in love. And so when they're singing it, it's just like you believe it. 
Um, believes in love. Believes. Believes in love. Um, I have some stuff on Justin Bieber later on, but yeah. is there anything you guys want to add to kind of his history? And yeah. Like, yeah. So like the, you, like you said, in 2007, Ooh. he starts his own company and he starts looking for acts. And, and I mean, honestly, it didn't take very long for it to be successful, right? I mean, he eventually had a joint venture between with RBMG mm -hmm. with, it was him, him and Usher. So it, again, those, those connections seem to have paid off pretty quickly. Yeah. And then by the time you get to 2000, so all the way to fast forward to 2013, so six years, and that's when he gets Ariana Grande. Damn. And when did, and then when did Justin come into the picture? Was I mean, it, he was, he was the I mean, second were, act he signed. Second act he signed. Okay. So that he signed up, uh, what he wanted, he wanted someone in the hip hop industry who loved hip hop, hip hop, but was kind of nerdy and like spoke to the white boys. Yeah. And wasn't trying to be all like gangster and like what he wasn't. He found this kid on MySpace. I forget his name. Forgive me for that. Um, but who's, I mean, can you, uh, can you look up the guy who he signed? Uh, it was uh, his, his, <coughs> not Justin Bieber. It wasn't That's Justin Bieber. It was some other to. guy right off the bat. It was, it was his first or second signing to it. Anyways, it was a white kid. Uh, he was like, I want someone that speaks to the white boys. And like he said, like, no, like hip hop is becoming so popular, but like, if you're not gangster and you're not from the street, why are you trying to act that way? So he found this kid who was really good rapping about like being in college and being a like, white guy, but he was trying to look all serious. Cause that's all he knew. And, yeah, and he went yeah. to him and was like, Hey man, like you be you, this whole like happy guy in college. Yeah. Um, did you find his name by any chance? Okay. Um, what did, but, what did you search, by the way? I'm just curious. Who did Scooter Braun first sign, but uh, it got autocorrected to Scooter Brain. So it's taking me a minute. <laughs> oh, never mind. Scooter Brain. But, but so he found him. And then the second person he signed was Justin Bieber, and he found him on YouTube, which... Irene, can you pull up that first YouTube? Which is uh, a, that's a that's a miss for the rest of the industry, right? He would already well, because Scooter's whole thing, right, was YouTube is YouTube is it, yes. right? And so the theory would go then you would think that if anybody else recognized it, that somebody would have grabbed Justin first. Yeah, so, but they didn't. They first off, he had him for two years before he released anything. Yeah, he signed him at thirteen. I mean, do you have that video? Pull that up. Make that full screen. Would you, first off, if you saw this video, would you sign this kid? If you're just going off thumbnails, no. Yeah. It's a no, right? And and if you're any normal executive, somebody sends you this clip and it's like, no, no. like I can't. It's, but it's he's if a kid. <laughs> what is it from uh, American Idol? It's a, it's a no for me. That's a no for me. No but he's me. like 11 here. T 10 or 11. Go ahead and push play, right? Can't even see him. There he is. Baby. It's not bad. No, he can sing. Okay, good. But like for real though, like he's 10. Yeah. When I was 10, it was just like, I only knew one note. I played it all. The time. <laughs> and it was in like, you're using the audio. It's not even on a mic. Like it's used no. just the audio from the video camera that's old. And it's like, he's next to his bedroom door there. Like. Is that his channel? Any executive. Yeah, it's his channel. That's fun. Like and what's that? 15 years ago yeah. or something? But you're looking at this kid and you're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to invest I'm a you, ton of money. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to risk it for this kid and another hip hop artist, white guy. And he signs him. And it was 11 months in and they hadn't had any success yet. Justin hadn't released anything. The other kid hadn't had any success yet. The hip hop artist that he had signed. Um, and he called his dad and he was like, dad, hey, how how you doing? The dad was like, hey, man, I'm pretty good. How are you doing? He said, I'm broke down in tears. He's like, dad, I'm failing. I have enough money for 13 months. I'm 11 months in and we've got nothing. I'm just, I, I failed everybody. By this time, Justin had moved from Canada and he's living in a, a like a, a condo up the road that he's paying for. With his mom, right? With his mom. Yeah. And he's paying for the school of, you know, Justin. And then he's got this other hip hop artist that he's having to front. They're trying to front. They, they, none of them had labels yet. Can you so, relate to this? <laughs> can I relate to this? Yes, I can. But you know, I loved it though. I yeah, loved that. Yeah, the lot but of pressure. His dad could have given him a bunch of money. Yeah. But you know what he gave him? Good advice. And he was just like, well, you've got a few months left. Let's see what can happen. And it was the next day that the hip hop artist came in and brought him the song called I Love College, which I know that name. So look up the guy. It's called I Love College. And that song wow. saved their company. 
from the publishing alone. And it was called I Love College, which if you could find that, I would love to how, just watch it. How often though is that the case? Like w- that's kind of a theme that we've- The 11th hour kind of? like, yeah, we keep hitting on is like- Who is this guy? You push and you I push and you push and then like it's the- it's Asher? Like, Asher Asher, Asher yeah, that's the name. His, Asher? Yeah. Is he still an artist? I mean, go ahead and turn it up real quick. I want to hear this. Oh. I'm nice right now, man. I, I feel good. It sounds a little like Eminem. You have a drink. Turn it up a little bit. Please put it in the air. Party last night was awfully crazy. I wish it was uh, empty. Have you heard I this? I know this. I danced my face off and had this one girl completely naked. Drink my drink. As you do. You know? Yeah, as you do. Scooter. Ah, uh, that was him? Oh, yeah. So the music video was shot after it had oh, a little sure. bit of legs. <laughs> The so budget. anyways, yeah, thank you for stopping that. So there's two video versions, a, an older version, and this one's the MTV version. Oh, uh, let's see the older version. I'm, I always love the original stuff because it could be shittier. <clears throat> is he, so again, is he still an artist? Yeah, yeah, he just, uh, I'll, I have some info on him. It's, oh, that looks like the same. I'm nice, right? Yeah, probably it's the same video. They just put it on MTV. I, I feel- Mm. Yeah, they did that. Sometimes they make deals um, with certain things. But this guy, eventually, he didn't really want to be as big as Scooter wanted him to be. Like, he he oh. didn't want the, like, everywhere he goes, everybody knows his names. And that's what Scooter wants. So they yeah. kind of butted heads. They're still friends, but they they split ways. And he's like, I just I just want to be an artist and still have a family. And I, he wanted right. to be a school teacher. <laughs> he loves school college. Teacher. Oh, yeah, apparently, yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but he saw these guys, and that saved them so yeah. that's kind of as far as i looked into scooter um so he started making a little bit of money yeah, a little bit of money. Cha-ching. Cha-ching. are we going to talk about taylor swift um we yes oh oh before we go forward with taylor swift justin bieber's baby we all know that song you were singing earlier baby yeah. baby yeah did you know that there's a secret famous person in the music video before they were famous no okay irene pull up this video, make it full screen. This is and this is little Jacob Colgan before yeah. anybody knew who he <laughs> okay. was. Don't in the background <laughs> as an extra. <laughs> make sure you leave this one muted because they will copyright strike us. Now look, it's right after this. Tell me if you could see it's on the left hand side. See if you could, can tell who it is. It's coming up. Is she gonna pause it? N- no. Oh wait. Oh, oh, it's Drake. Drake. It's Drake. Drake. Was that when? Drake is I'm trying in, to think when was this? So is he, before around Drake the Degrassi was, years on yeah. Nickelodeon. This is before Drake yeah. was famous. It would have, have to have been like Mickey Mouse Club Drake or I, Was he in Mickey Mouse Club? I thought he was too. Or was he was he you, wait, you said Nickelodeon, uh Irene? Oh. Yeah, has that show called Degrassi? Oh, uh, okay. He played a kid in a wheelchair. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Why does that make you laugh? I don't know. Phil. I don't know, I don't you got know. a dark soul, my friend. <laughs> um, but yeah, so he just I, doesn't strike me as a as a believable. <laughs> like now like no. I think about him now, like he he couldn't he definitely couldn't pull off kid in a wheelchair now. His persona uh, uh, no. is too too big. Larger than life. That's uh but I well, I remember watching baby, I was like, is that is that Drake? And he's in there so, several times. He's acting so corny. I swear to God, he. That's what I mean. Like he, yeah. he's like, he's, so, yeah. So how Drake is, he... is so rich and powerful. He's yeah. just mastered time travel. He's yeah. paid for the the way back machine. <laughs> yeah, and uh, he can just go back and jump in these videos. Uh, anyways, I thought that was it. That's literally, I think, all I got. So for Justin this was story. famous before Drake was. Oh yeah, in the industry, in, in in the music industry, he had some of that acting fame, I suppose. But that that's wild. So Scooter is so damn connected. Do you want to get into, like at one point in time, did he manage, this is where I'm confused. Did he manage Taylor or what, what's, so, so what's up? We'll get to, we so the ta- we're going straight to Taylor Swift. Let's do well, it. No, or I mean, go to what you got. Yeah. Well, so like, so in 2013, he gets Ariana Grande. And then by 2016, her label, which maybe we need to pull the diagram back up. I don't know, but is Republic Records, mm-hmm. huge label, right? In 2016, Grande's label, Republic Records, confirmed that Braun served as her main manager, handling all aspects of her career. He and signed her like initially. TV stuff? Yeah, all of it. All oh, of it. Oh, wow. So then SB Ventures, Money. Scooter Braun Ventures, which is not Scooter Braun Projects, but okay. SB Ventures, right, is handling television campaigns, branding. So again, it gets over into the other section of your diagram there. You're talking about 
pass into the publishing yep. movies, so, TVs, handled television campaigns, branding, music licensing deals, tour sponsorships, including the very famous Calvin Klein wow. campaign with Justin Bieber. So he's making some serious yeah. so money. So he so he had multiple. He was handling not just the manager manager part. He was actually getting stakes and some of this other stuff too. Wow. So he was really like he ba- like I'm glad you put this up because it's really helped me. But it's almost like. If you would have given him that diagram, he would have been like, yeah, I know. I'm just going to kind of do all of that at the same time. <laughs> like, I know. I'm going to be this one guy that does all of it. And then, and then of course, um, that his company also did the partnership with Kanye, and that got connected to Adidas, right? So Scooter was involved. No, no. Yeah. No, yeah. he got some of those, the Adidas money? He was, yeah. Even if it would have been 1% of that several and billion he, do, dollars. Do we know whether, so it's one thing to say he was a part of, negotiating that and doing his manager duties and getting paid as a manager. Do we know if he got so like, like the, the, ownership the, in any of that? Like did the, he get the company, meaning his company SB ventures. Mm-hmm. So whatever ownership portion he had in SB ventures mm-hmm. brokered the partnership between Kanye and Adidas. Whoa. Great. But but you could, you could get, I would bet scooter got ownership. Cause like, That's I know what I'm we're going to talk about this. Cause I'm he sure owns I, some of like Taylor Swift stuff. Yeah. Like even though it's being sold back and forth each time he's getting a little bit of money. I would imagine that SB ventures probably got Adidas stock or something like Had that. To I would imagine that they did. Which, if we're wrong, let us know. <clears throat> yeah, but go ahead. We're just going to assume that that's the case. I mean, he's a kind of ruthless little bit of a business because it could have, it could have been, you know, Kanye would have been like, "Hey, broker this deal, I'll give you fifty grand," and then he did it, and yeah. you know, then it goes on the resume, and he could get, he could essentially demand more money down the road. But um, now we can get into some of his other investment stuff. But if we want to go to the Taylor Swift thing, this and this was really enlightening for me because I thought, I think when it all went down. <clears throat> the way it was portrayed in the media, at least to my understanding, was that like Scooter Braun was this evil person that had stolen Taylor's music. That is how Taylor is, described is, is, is it, Is that yes. fair to say that that's how it was portrayed? Yeah, if you look at her Twitter, yeah. like he stole it, but I think he paid a lot of money so, for it, didn't he? So, let's, so in 2019, there's this other company that he had, Ithaca Holdings is Scooter Braun's holding company. Mm-hmm. So now there's got this Ithaca Holdings is at the very top and then SB Projects is underneath mm-hmm. that, SB Ventures underneath that and all of his other stuff. If, just, if real quick, let me interject just a yeah. little bit for people that don't know. If you look at the diagram again, the label actually owns the recording of the song. When you sign to a label, the label mm-hmm. is then paying for the recordings of the song. Yes, Dave, you own the rights of the intellectual property of the writing of the song. But if I'm the label, I own that song. So I can do whatever I want to with it. That's why when you sign with these people, sometimes you feel like you're selling your soul because it's the recording. So those are are the masters, which is what you're going to talk about in a second. That's that's called the masters. So in June 2019, Ithaca, so Scooter's Holding Company, acquired Big Machine Label Group. (laughs) Another huge label, right? And in that purchase, it included the Masters, Taylor Swift, six albums. Six do, you albums. Know, do you know the purchase price of Big Machine? So, of Big Machine? Yeah. No, I don't know. I mean, can you look up? The, you, I think it was $300 million. $300 million for that? <laughs> yeah. Let me confirm. I mean, it's probably well, already so got, it, think, got the history and everything. <laughs> yeah. And then, so, obviously, so, so, so to say it yeah, was- Yeah, three, $300 million. Yeah. So, to say that Scooter went, like, yes, it is technically true he bought- Taylor Swift's music, but really what he bought was an entire music label, which happened to have Taylor Swift. Now, I'm sure in the forefront of his mind with that purchase was, if I buy this label, I've got it. So I don't, so I don't, but, but it's not just as simple as he went out and like stole Taylor's music right. from her. Well, but well, that's not he, the end of the story though. That's not why no, she no, was no. pissed. I don't think she liked, because I knew she didn't really like Scooter that much when he was purchasing. He was She was a little upset with the owner of Big Machine Record Label. That's who, so to me, Scott the way Borchetta. I read this yeah, is Scott that Borchetta. Scott Borchetta is the real bad guy. It, it seems a little bit weird to me that Scooter got so much hate, and mm-hmm. the Scott Borchetta guy seems to not have been mentioned. What, but I mean, at the same time, though, like Dan and Shay's stuff was yeah. probably sold with that as well. I yeah. mean, when you buy a label, you buy the whole label. Like, you own all the assets it has. Yeah, but that's not the problem. See, that's where people get confused, though, with this whole story, is they think, like, oh, she's mad because he bought the label. It's chapter two that she's mad at. Chapter yeah. two. Do you have chapter two? Chapter yeah. two is when he sells them. Yeah, 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 for a lot of money. We'll continue. A, a I don't want to steal money. your thunder then. No, it's okay. So, 
anyway, so he buys he buys uh, Ithaca buys Big Machine Label Group. The CEO Scott Borchetta stays on as CEO, so it essentially yeah. becomes a wholly owned, like underneath underneath Ithaca, right? And in 2020, Ithaca then sells the six album masters to Shamrock Holdings. For, Which this is when the, there was certain companies that were yeah. literally buying up the masters of tons of people. Everything. So, yeah. uh, Sting. Um, you talked about doing that for like old, like old uh, songs from like the fifties yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Which then nobody wants you. Wise. Buy them up. You hold them. Then everybody has to access you for them. Yeah. 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 It's for $405 million. Oh my gosh. So, so he made hundred and five million off. So of that? there was profit there, right? And then, and then in 2021, a South Korean company named Hybe announced that it would acquire Ith- Ithaca Holdings from Braun. So now Ooh, Scooter for for one point zero five billion. Gosh, a b- b- billion. And he's yeah. he, he's what thirty yeah. nine at that time? Yeah, basically. And and <sighs> as part of the deal, Braun would become Hybe's America CEO. So again, Ithaca Holdings underneath that, so, all of Scooter stuff. So he sold everything for a billion, and then still somehow moves up, in the yeah. <laughs> and is still yeah. making a salary. Yeah. yeah, dang. Yeah. So then, in 2023, Hive acquires Quality Control Music for 300 million, with Kevin Coach K Lee and Pierre P Thomas maintaining control of the label under Braun. So again, so so he sold the label on no. Okay. So a different so Hive, which is now above Ithaca, it now owns Ithaca. They buy another label. For for three hundred million, and that label was shoveled underneath Braun because again, Braun is it's another U.S. based label. Wow. So he's a CEO of Hybe North America. So not only so he didn't have I mean, it's like the South Korean company who he's now a CEO of their America their North American branch essentially. So now he now he's just getting more and more stuff put underneath him. Whether wow. he has much to do with it or not, it's like this this big company from South Korea is like, well, it's North America, so you get more. Here's something cool about the South Korean company. He said when they were going through the due diligence of selling the company, they were doing a lot of FaceTime back and forth, any type of skyping between the owner of that Asian company. What's uh, the Vibe uh, South uh, Korea Vibe or Ibe Hybe. Hybe. Okay, Hybe. so similar to Hybe. Hybe. That's right. Hybe. with a B. So. He, they were FaceTiming a lot, just trying to get to know each other. And he said to Scooter, he's like, I know that our lawyers and everybody has to do due diligence, but let's, but we're just going to make this happen. I'm going to make yeah. it happen. He goes, there's still a lot of due diligence. And what they mean by due diligence, making sure the money is actually real. The assets are actually there. Yeah. The, the paperwork, the contracts are correct. But he said, we're just going to do it. And he goes, well, why? We kind of have a lot to do still. And he goes, because in the West, when you're talking about selling something, Usually the CEOs and the owners of the companies are always talking about the sale, the sale. Mm. But in Eastern companies, they always talk about what they're going to do afterwards. They don't really focus on the sale. The sale is just part of the future. And he said, when he was talking with Scooter, Scooter barely even mentioned the sale. He was always talking about what we can do in the future. And so he vibed with him so much, believed in him, trusted him so much. He was like, we're just going to make this happen. Scooter gets off the phone, calls his people, said, just make it happen. And then basically- There was a billion dollars a on the A billion line. dollars One on the billion line. billion dollars on the line. But it goes to show that he was so focused on not the, the dollar. Because yeah. when, you when you have money- He was already super he was wealthy. So wealthy. He, was, he was already generationally forever wealthy before that deal. But that goes to show, and something I'm going to take from this podcast, a lot of times it's not always on that moment. It's like, what can you? what's the future of this, this endeavor? And that's why he's the CEO- of yeah. this company is because it's like, hey, if I can get this capital, if we can do this, here's what we can do. Yeah. And I think that's something <laughs> us in America can do. Yeah, really. like the sale is just a, it's a means to an end. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people get focused on that means versus the actual end result, which is, you know, the companies coming together or like what yeah. we're going to do in the future. All he so, saw yeah. was like, man, I'm about to get the biggest infusion of capital <laughs> of my life yeah. and my mm-hmm. career. And what can I, how can I then reinvest it yeah. into other ventures, but you, you wanted to get back into like why Taylor Swift was yeah, mad. Yeah, go to chapter like two. Why? Why okay. was it? Why was it a controversy at all? Yeah, so <clears throat> I I totally understand why Taylor Swift was pissed. I get it, but that doesn't mean that it was objectively wrong. Um, and I yeah. I don't think that it was personally. Leg- Excuse me, legally it's not. Even even morally, I'm okay. not sure that it was. I, I think probably a conversation sh- could have and should have been had because Taylor Swift is you know is and was at the time, I mean, you know, one of the biggest stars out there, but um, I think certainly the biggest star on the label. But basically Ithaca Holdings, Scooter Bronze, 
company, holding company, purchased her label, the, the label she was on, Scott Borchetta's label, Big Machine Records. And with that came the, the masters for those six records. So mm-hmm. she didn't own them anyway. They were yeah. owned by Big Machine. Big Machine was bought by Ithaca. So now Ithaca owns them. And Ithaca, Scooter Braun, made the decision a year, a year later to sell those to Shamrock Capital. Um, and it had every legal right to do so. It was the owner of, you know, that intellectual property. Um, we don't know what decisions or what, um, you know, what went into that decision. I mean, obviously there was hundred million, hundred million dollars in profit. That's, yeah. that's, I'm sure a big driver, but who knows, um, you know, what acquisition costs or debts or other things were involved. Um, you know, and, and maybe there would be no big machine it had, had those not been sold off. You know, we don't know the health of the, the companies at the time, but, um, <clears throat> just for people that like don't understand that um, kind of how ownership typically works for in the music industry um, to look at this from Taylor Swift's perspective, she was uh, on, on most of her songs, most of the six albums, she would have been presumably one of the writers on most of those songs. Uh, most songs nowadays involve ownership from a couple of writers that the artist the producer, um, the producer, uh, with which you know, for Taylor Swift was a lot of times uh, Max Martin, especially later on. He's, you know, he's he's a producer in a lot, a lot of big hits. But you may have you know five people that are writers and owners of of the writing of the song. You know, the, the basically the melody and the lyrics, and then the record label says, okay, we want to make something of this. We want to make a final finished mastered song and push it out to the masses. But we're going to incur some costs in doing that. Um, there's some risk, there's some liability. Um, so we're going to own those masters and we're going to pay you a percentage once we've earned our money back. And, and so, what's the percentage typically? It, it varies. It depends on the deal. You know, if you're a, a lot of it's made up, a lot of them when they get audited later, oh, sorry, we missed $300,000 paying you. It yeah, depends yeah. like, okay, yeah. It, if you're brand new to the industry, not much. No. If you're an artist who can command a lot and go to another record label where they're going to pay you more. Like then Taylor. Um, Taylor. Then they'll they be prob- incentivized to pay you a lot yeah. higher. Percentage. Now, even though they sold, so I want you to get on what you're talking about, but even though they sold her masters back and forth, she's still still making the same amount of money when it plays and when it streams somewhere because they still yeah, have contracts like- with her. So they're selling the contract back and forth. So like if, if they if you sold, if I sold all your masters, but I agreed to you that you get 50% of it, you're still getting 50% if I sold it to Irene or to Phil. Yeah. So she's not, I think she's why not, she got really she's mad. Not getting, she's not getting nothing. Well, she was in the process I don't of trying know if that's, to- Do you know for yeah, sure? Yeah, I know for, that- yeah because like um, they own the masters- but there's still an agreement. Of so how when much Shamrock money. bought that from Ithaca, when they bought those masters, they would have to accept that there was already an existing agreement in place. There was right. an existing contract. So Shamrock would have to, in acquiring those masters, right. would have to know that they're going to pay Taylor 20%. Yes, whatever for, it would be. Okay. If, for, if, from my understanding, where she yeah. was mad was she was trying to purchase her masters at the same time. Yeah. And yeah. so in order to, this is the or weird part. Or at least said she wanted to, whether well, she was she like actively in, trying, I don't so know. So it well, sounds like you know that he said, she said thing, right? Because right. she claimed she was, and and then like Scott Borchetta was like, oh, she never, like right. he claims However, that she never asked about it or whatever. Here's what she said. And this is what's, if it's true, it's shady and shitty on his part, um, on Scooter's part, yeah. was when she was trying to purchase it before they would get into the finances of everything, she had to sign an NDA that basically said she was never allowed to say anything bad about Scott Borchetta in the future ever. Mm. She was like, I'm not going to sign that. What if this, What if we find out it's like bullshit and all this stuff? So she wouldn't sign it so they wouldn't sell it. So it was kind of like one of the things where her lawyers and a few other lawyers were saying, this is weird that you have to sign an NDA about not making fun of the owner as yeah. one of the main proper like headers in the contract, which is odd. Like, And dude, if she writes like an awesome diss track, you know it's going to number one. Yeah. And, and he's going to make money off of it. And he's going to get richer too. I don't well, you know. But so anyways, let's get go back to this because yeah. I want to drive this yes, home. Yes, please do. Sorry. There's, there's, when you're, when you're Taylor Swift and you're done with a song, you've, mm-hmm. you've recorded it. It's ready to go to market. The, the song itself exists in really sort of two capsules simultaneously. There's the, the mastered finished track that we're all going to hear on the radio. And then there's the, the writing of the song again, lyrics and melody. Um, those can, and typically are owned by two very different entities. So the master, as we've talked about, is owned by the record label. 
And the record label, when they go to market with that, they put everything behind it. They, and that's why you're, you're with a record label because um, they're going to help you record it really well. They're going to bring you the best musicians, the best studios. They're going to um, get it the best airtime. You're going to do your radio tours. They're going to help fund your tour because they want to earn as much back on that as possible. And usually most artists are going to get a, a draw initially where they get paid up front to create their albums for with Taylor Swift. In this case, she had, she had agreed to do six albums with Big Machine. Damn. Um, and so they were paying her a lot up front. But once the label, um, once once it makes up all its costs, then it starts paying out a percentage to mm-hmm. the artist. So like I said, we're just we're just going to say, you know, Taylor Swift was getting 20%. I have no idea. Could have yeah. been well, more, could have been less. And to your point, but, the label is out too. So they're, they're recouping their, they're not making a profit at that until that point either. Right. Because right, right, they, have right. to, they have to recover their costs. So they're investing. Before, yeah. They're investing in this person. So, um, you know, for every hundred dollars that comes in of revenue that comes into the label for, for streaming for, you know, presumably for concerts, if it's like a 360, 360 deal, um, for, uh, I mean, anything Taylor Swift music related for every hundred dollars coming in, Taylor Swift would be getting 20 in that case. Um, your point is that when those masters were sold off to, um, by, by Ithaca to Shamrock Capital, presumably that, um, that agreement was still being honored. So I'm assuming. as, as you know, and we don't know that. that's the thing is like, I, I couldn't find, she's really pissed about this, but we, well, yeah, we could assume that she's still earning that 20% or whatever percentage from, you know, it, from Shamrock Capital. It seems like if there was some new agreement that we would have heard about it, at least from her, like, yeah, they, they forced like Shamrock had me sign this new agreement and I was, you know, and I'm, I'm getting 20% instead of 30 now, or like, we, I feel like we would have heard that at some point. So it seems like the original agreement would have had to stay in place. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, if it's, if- I, I feel like the future of artists, especially at, at Taylor's level is going to be owning more of your masters Oh, yeah. because, um, as you as you know, Taylor was like, "Well, screw this! I'm just re-recording all my songs," mm-hmm. and so she has her own which versions is of it. Awesome, and then re-releasing so them on the market, which is diluting their mm-hmm. stuff as well. So, um, and now she's on tour with well, it, I mean, and it's the biggest tour like of all time. Well, I mean, so let's talk about that though, real quick. Famously, um, uh, the Beatles guy, what's his name? The main Beatles guy, George Martin? No, no, no. The be- um, you mean one of the Beatles? The the, the main Beatles guy, Paul the McCartney. Paul McCartney. Thank you, Paul McCartney. God, I'm terrible. Paul McCartney was talking to Michael Jackson and, and, and Paul McCartney was like telling Michael Jackson, it's all about owning your masters. You should buy your masters. And he goes, you know, he's joking with him. He goes, how about I buy your masters? And he laughed. Mm. Ha, ha, ha. And like the next year, Michael Jackson bought the Beatles yeah. masters. And to this day, I believe I'm not certain mm-hmm. they own their, that, that, that his, basically his trust owns trust the Beatles holding company, whatever it is. Yeah. 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 So anyways, go ahead, Dave. Sorry. Well, so that, what you guys just were talking about brings me to this hand, which is again the the writing of the song. Mm. She can, as an owner of that song, one of one of presumably many, she can go to other record labels, or she can, as her own label, independently release new versions of those songs. A um, lot of professionals in in this space have said that that is probably not something that will long term generate success. People, um, you kind of have to be at the top to do that with well, a lot of capital. And also the re-releasing of your existing songs is is not something when it's been done before, which it has, it's not been really successful. Really? Now, I don't know that... Well, and she had to go not just do that. She had to re-record. Yeah, them, right. Which is... With an adult s- voice. Six and not- albums worth of songs oh that she's already recorded and it takes, you know, that would, that would have taken months. It would yeah, have taken and, years. And it'd be really expensive. Really yeah. expensive. Um, and so, because the other thing too is like, you're, you're sort of rewriting history. We sort of joked about going back in time, but like early Taylor Swift, and we've seen this before too, people are willing to, out of the goodness of their heart, do kind things and take risks for up and coming artists because they want to be a part of that story. Um, you know, Taylor Swift didn't have uh, everything going for her and on top of the world and this proven entity. Um Presumably there were people along the way up, because I know that that we've all experienced this too, that give you a shot and that want to kind of get behind you. Mm-hmm. Taylor Swift now trying to come back and do that same thing. I, I have to think it's going to cost her a lot more money to get like the big time musicians, the big time studios, producers. Um, she is that proven entity. Mm. Um, she's not up and coming. She's not like winging a prayer. Like she's, yeah. I mean, she's one of the heaviest hitters in the industry 
Um, do you think people it'll are going to want a piece of that? Huh? Do you think it'll backfire her re-releasing her? Masters? I don't know that she'll actually do it, honestly. But um, what she can do, the the she can. Um, so as a writer, she splits. Uh, in addition, so the, the way it works typically in the industry is nine cents a song. So for every dollar made um, out of a song sale or, or play or anything like that, um, writers get a combined nine cents per song. So if you got five writers on a song, you're splitting nine. You're cents. splitting it. Damn. You know, splitting it. Well, five ways. Splitting that nine cents five ways. But that's after you've already cut it in half with the publisher. So so the publisher is getting fifty percent of that nine cents. So, so four and a half cents for five people. You could have picked right. some easier numbers, but that's well, I'm just, yeah, I know, well, but I'm saying that's, that's the industry, by the way, yeah, it's like, yeah, it yeah. gets really complex it's and kind really of a convoluted joke and it needs to change. Like the way that it works, the way oh, it structures yeah. the contracts, these three, 360 deals. I mean, that's why you got people just bypassing it at all. And being yeah. like, fine. You know what? I'm cool with only selling or streaming 1 million songs a month and just being fine with that revenue. I'm pulling yeah. in 30,000 a month. I'm touring a little bit, making a hundred thousand. Yeah. They're happy with that instead of making, selling, yeah. streaming a hundred million songs and still making the same amount well, of money. And, and so yeah. the, not, not to invoke Joe Rogan too much, but mm -hmm. Joe Rogan Spotify deal, yeah. I think is a harbinger of things to come in the music industry because Spotify oh. could very easily, because, because, because what, what's the difference between an artist who only streams on Spotify versus Rogan who only puts his, he has that license. So, do you Spotify. think Spotify is going to start going to Taylor Swift? They could just and be like, say only on this album of this. We'll pay for the album. You can maintain this, but you only have it on this. That's why not? Why not? Here's a fat check for twenty million. So yeah. Spotify owns the masters. No, so, I, I, I would licensing deal. Licensing no, deal. No, purely oh. licensing. It would because it would benefit them yeah. for five years, ten yeah. years, only on this streaming app. Period. Yeah. And that way, because then you, because then you're like, you're because to me, you have to break. You have to break the business model, right? And right. that's what Spotify did with Joe. Yeah, they gave him a hundred million dollars to take all what at that point in time was like sixteen hundred episodes, yeah. minus a few that they didn't like, and put him on there exclusively. Yeah, and he still own owns the entire he has rights, all the IP. They have they have nothing to do with it, and so it's like you and and of course what started happening. All these other artists on Spotify are like, oh, we're we're boycotting it because of stuff he said. But it's just like, okay, hold on, it's like. Spotify, I think Spotify is onto something with that. Yeah. Mm. I think they're onto something with that. There's because, a lot to the label going away. Because yeah. like, it, it's, I mean, we saw it over COVID. Things are dying off right and left. And, yeah. and there's not as much money. So there's not enough people to make, there's not enough of the pie left for that whole diagram right there. And, <laughs> and, and artists too, if they see, if they sense that there's some, an option out there that's pro-artist. Yeah. And that's legitimately pro-artist. It's, yeah. I mean, Spotify is for profit, no doubt, but they're pro. They're like, listen, Joe, just you only stream it here. You keep your IP. We leave you alone. Yeah. If they start doing that with artists and, and again, keep it to like three year, five year deals, all of a sudden the artists are going to be like, well, wait a second. I'm going to get a, a much higher percentage anyway. Who pays for the tour and, though? That's the question. So, so the touring, I think will still be maintained by the booking agencies. And I mean, unfortunately, right now we could talk about this on another podcast. Well, the booking agency is not going to front the cost sure. for the tour, right? No, but like it's isn't that typically no, the record yeah. label? So I'm just saying, Spotify yeah, would have to gotta, be able to like shell out for that because the difference was Spotify Rogan is bigger is, than all those record yeah. labels, though. Fair enough. But I'm wondering if that just for publishing side, they could do that. But as far as the labels go, what if? What if? I mean, like, look at uh, what is it? Live Nation owns most of the major venues. They've Monopoly the whole Ticketmaster thing because they own Ticketmaster now. Mm -hmm. So that's another podcast. Maybe for we another have, day. yeah, maybe part yeah. two of the podcast. We'll um, that, we're gonna wrap, have to wrap this up. There's people upstairs waiting for another podcast. Um, but let's let's wrap it up. My as wife, far, yeah, you're, yeah. There's people and, that came and out. Your of, wife, yeah, under the sun, under, under the, the sun, sun podcast. podcast. Uh, so I think Scooter did a good job. He's young. I think he's. Made a few mistakes. He's he's admitted to a bunch of them, and he said, "You know, just gotta learn learn from them." I'm still gonna argue. I don't think this whole thing was a mistake with Taylor Swift per se. I think how he oh. how he went about it, which he he has said that he would change it. He would change how he did it. Well, he told the company not to tell Taylor. Oh, I didn't know that. That was one of the clauses in the contract. <laughs> See, so mm -hmm. he he plays a little bit of the whatever, but like. He wanted that money and he yeah. didn't want a publicity thing. He wanted it sold and then he wanted to deal with the aftermath. But I just, I still feel, I know we're wrapping up, but I still feel like she could have, nothing really would have changed a lot about her life and presumably nothing did. Uh, she didn't own the masters anyways before Scooter sold them. 
She and doesn't made now. a ton of money before, and, and she doesn't own them now. Well, right. yeah, she doesn't own those masters, right? Presumably, now. she was making twenty percent, fifty percent, sixty percent with Big Machine owning them. I would think that you know maybe with uh, Shamrock Capital now she's you, they're still honoring that contract. I don't know, but she could still take her songs and sync license elsewhere. Uh, she could re-record. Like she's not totally. Yeah, it's a like, bit oh. of. It's, I, I see where you're, you're. It's a bit of first world problems. Maybe is, <laughs> is what you're saying. Yeah. I think that, in, and this is something that should go forward and probably is going to, have to be a law. But if if you created something, and there shouldn't be something where you you created something but you have no part of it, you don't own it. Whatsoever. Right. That's like, what you do every day at work. But, well, yeah, I understand yeah. that. But that's I'm just how it saying, works as an engineer at a big company. It's, yeah. sli- it's slightly different because he's a part of a big a if little. You're, if you're a contractor, a consultant, you can have ownership, then Correct. you can patent. But Correct. as an employee, right? That's how yep. as an engineer. Every yeah. every invention that I come up with while on in while employed by this company, it's even if it has nothing to do with their business, it's theirs. And you can't take I, it elsewhere. And, I cannot. I just know. think that it'd be cool if there was some way to have it to where like if. She, they sold this thing that she could get 5%, 2% of the sale, no matter who it went to. So she's exactly. making money. And then, because it's something she created, she made up out of nothing. Yes, there was a label. Yes, they covered some stuff. But we can all admit, with being in the industry, it's pretty shady. Yeah. A lot of the yeah, stuff has happened. But I'm just saying, like, it's kind of like you sign on the dotted yes. lines, on the dotted line for your student loans, and then... You go get the education and then decide you don't want to pay your student loans back. Oh, that's, that's another podcast too. Yeah, fine, but, fine, yeah, but yes. I'm saying I'm saying she agreed to this at the beginning. Yeah. It's not like yeah, right. it's not like she didn't know that the label was going to own she the masters. Was 15, she, she, fine, <laughs> yeah. but her. I, I know. From I, what know. I understand her parents were pretty involved. Like I, you know, but either way, even the she, manager, the manager would have made her manager would have made a lot more had he been like, no, we're we're going to own the masters. Like her, her manager surely knew the game. Well. But right. again, it, it goes back to on. it goes back to what I said though. Like if you're new yeah. to the business, you have to make some concessions. You have to get in, and so uh, arguably agreeing to do six records uh, right up front like that was like maybe it should have been three, yeah. and then we'll reassess. But she agreed to six. She agreed that they would own as Big Machine the masters. Um, Big Machine sold, and Big Machine like assets went with it. Yeah, or not not the what I say the records the masters, and that's and that's so the, went with it. That's their that's their responsibility to their shareholders. Yeah. Right. Pro- public or private, they have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders to Maximize take the profit. capital they have in 2007 and be bigger, more of that capital in 2023. And if a good deal comes along where they can sell, yeah. Then that that's their responsibility to do that. It's not it's not like we're trying to stick it to Taylor. And no, I, w- I would no. maybe argue too that like Taylor coming out and creating this this narrative where she was this victim of Scooter Braun, uh, I think had this effect of of her fans rallying behind yeah. her and and elevating her even further. So you could even argue that maybe she uh, plays the victim really good. Well, yeah, like yeah. you you could argue that it helped her. Maybe, oh, sure. You know, maybe yeah. it helped her more than a hundred million dollars worth that if she would have sold it. You know, in the first place. Man, that girl can sell out a stadium. Man. Although she's, I think she's worth like she three basically or like million. crashed every app like yes. Ticketmaster and Capital and Capital One had like this special like pre-sale deal and like Capital One's website crashed because everybody's trying. Damn. to... All like, right, so next podcast know. Taylor Swift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I say why not? <laughs> we can yeah. do that and we can we expand can. on this. But, um, but I appreciate. I'll say one more thing. I, I really appreciate you guys uh, bringing me on. It's all, always fun. But but I I loved having us dig into Scooter because I I think probably just out of ignorance and maybe just not enough research had sort of been like, oh yeah, he's this record label, like this manager record label guy. And I'm sure he's scummy like all the rest of them. And he, I'm sure he's done all these things. And and by reading into it, it's like, no, this guy is, has, has, is smart. He's forward thinking, always has been really good investor, both inside and outside the music industry, knows it well, has continues to find talent and develop it. And I, I, and the narrative I think got twisted a little bit too negatively. He, there mm-hmm. may have been some shady stuff, a little bit of shady stuff going on, but but it seems to me like I, I have developed a little bit more of a positive opinion of Scooter. And in, in, in he's got that green thumb, that green thumb of the music yeah. industry for sure. He can pick talent. 
Yeah. And I think at the end of the day, it's easy to see 2020. We don't know what the decisions they made when selling these companies, or we also don't know the state at which those companies were at and they may have need, they may have needed the capital. If you're in a highly capital intensive business, sometimes it can, it might look big on paper, like four, like you said, $400 million. Oh, wow. It's like, well, how much of that, like, were they underwater? You know, they could have been. uh, Scooter was so connected that when he brought on Justin Bieber, he's like, yeah, you're good. But I'm going to introduce you to the Usher, and Usher's going to introduce you Usher. to Usher, uh, <laughs> and Usher introduced him to a swag coach, a coach that a would teach coach? Justin oh, Bieber how to have a little more of swag. Who is this cool. Usher? So the uh, next time, so the next time I'm on the podcast and you introduce me, I think you can you can I say can I'm, a, I'm a swag, swag coach. coach. Swag coach, <laughs> and just you just go. Yeah. <laughs> Hi gosh, I'm a swag coach. Um, yeah. Uh, we're gonna have to wrap this up. Scooter Braun, you're a brilliant man. It'd be cool to meet him one day. Um, it would, but don't, but don't trust him to yeah. to uh, be the caretaker no. of your expensive yeah. stuff. I would your trust valuable things. I would trust him he to do a contract on my behalf <laughs> in a yes. business deal. There yes, there you go. That, Please um, negotiate for us. Yeah. So, anyways, we got to wrap this up. Send us off, David. Guys, thanks for joining us today. Chasing Mountains podcast. Make sure you subscribe, comment below. Let us know what you think of the talk. Phil, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, guys. Really Always a pleasure. It. Looking forward to next time. And yeah. for all you Taylor Swift fans, Phil hates Taylor Swift so much. And his social <laughs> media accounts are... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> He's yeah. actually... Are you, you're a fan. So. You, can, you can send him that way. They won't find any Taylor Swift hate on it. But. Well, I mean... It doesn't matter. They will destroy That's you. That's true. Yeah. It'll they be, will find it'll your be, house. Be, they will break <laughs> windows. My life will be over. Yeah. Just joking. He actually likes Taylor Swift. Thanks, everybody. See y'all. Thanks, guys. The thoughts and opinions on this show do not reflect those of our advertisers, employers, or other affiliates. The content should not be considered legal or financial advice. The Chasing Mountains podcast is a production of Chasing Mountains Media.